record you can so it's now recording yes okay so well um yeah i want to jump in because this whole thing began with me meeting Kadar at um a gathering in the into the wild gathering in the summer in the uk and um my very good friend had been to uh, one of your grief ceremonies up north and she was like, Jules, Jules, he's going to be at this festival. You have to go and meet him. So I was like, okay, well, da, 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 da. this guy's telling some stories. I don't know who he is. I never heard of him. And I sat down around this fire with you and a few of us gathered and there were the kids, yeah. like, you know, little pyromaniacs there. And you started speaking and you started telling this story and within about four minutes I was just like in tears and I was just sitting there in floods of tears for about the two the whole two hours that you told these stories I just sat there crying I felt like my soul was being remembered to something that is kind of you know it's like it's there every day but it was like something about what you were bringing and how you were bringing it. It like it woke up in that moment. And I just felt this, this hunger for this belonging and suddenly this sense of connection. And I was like, who is this guy? I got mm -hmm. to find out who this guy is. <laughs> so that was kind of where it began. And, um, I just really wanted to get you over here and have people over here experience your work because your work is clearly, really really special and really connected in a way that very much resonates and aligns with the work that we do here at earth heart so we've invited kadar over to run a death lodge here at earth heart which is in the middle of the beautiful forest here um which feels really right because the work is so embedded in nature and we'll be immersed in nature and the land here can support what we're doing and um so I'm sure Kadar can, as, as you do, as you speak to this Kadar, the Death Lodge, and it'll come out who you are and where you've come from and stuff. But obviously your, your lineage and your background is, you know, it's an impressive CV, but in a way that's, for me, that's not it. It's, there's a connection that I feel you have that goes beyond any kind of trainings that we do. You just have this inherent connection that I feel so many of us are hungry for. And, um, yeah you've got a way of speaking to that and connecting people to that so i'm really excited to have you on the call and to hear a bit more and hopefully it'll give people a chance who've been curious about doing the death lodge over here in june that um they can get a sense a bit more of a sense of what it is so that because they're firing loads of questions at me and i'm like i don't know ask adar so here we are <laughs> so yeah ready, jump in <laughs> Thank you, Jules. It's it's great to be here and to be with all of you. Those that are with us in the in the present moment, and those that will be joining later as they listen to the recording at another time. Um, so I like to begin the way I always begin, which is offering some gratitude and gratitude to the our, our ancestors, both our ancient and near ancestors, that uh, dreamed us into this place. Uh, on whose shoulders we stand and whose footprints and heartbeats and tears and laughter have been left in the ground as breadcrumbs for us to follow. Um, and also offer some gratitude to those ones that are in front of us, uh, our descendants, our, our grandchildren, our great, great grandchildren, um, who I think of as right now uh, praying to us as their ancestors that we might pay attention to these times that we're in and uh, respond to their prayers. So hopefully what we do here in this call and, and uh, in the Death Lodge retreat later this summer uh, will be a response to their prayers as well. So, so with that, I wanted to uh, begin with this, this name, Death Lodge. What is this thing? Why would somebody, it's like a grief ritual. Why would somebody want to come to such a thing called a grief ritual or Death Lodge? Those are different things, by the way. So Death Lodge is a term or a phrase that is uh, that which precedes uh, the initiatory passage, or uh, it could be a literal death, so that if, if one lived in an indigenous culture and you were nearing your, your, your end of your life, you might go to a place that was called the Death Lodge. 
and the death going to the death lodge would be to clean up, make right, resolve, finish all those things that were unfinished on your heart. Um, to call to you people that you meet, need to speak to. It was a place of preparing for the final passage so that in, in a lot of contexts when they say, may you have a good death, what this means is that you lived a beautiful life and that it, in, um, when one enters a death lodge, they enter that period of time of reconciliation and, and potential healing uh, for that which has happened in their life before they leave this life. So in a, in a more of a healing or initiatory passage kind of way, if you think of, of life, uh, if we generally say life begins at birth here and travels along this continuum and it comes to uh, our death somewhere down here. Uh, so from birth to death, you think of this river that flows this way. And the initiatory passage or transformational journey flows opposite the flow of life, like a river running side by side, moving in the opposite direction. And that river begins with a death and ends with a birth. So uh, great, I always say great journeys uh, are always preceded by great loss um, and transformation so that the it, th this process of death and rebirth within our life is uh -huh. to what I mean by death lodge. The death lodge is a place of healing, place of reconciliation, um, of reconnecting with our authentic self um, beyond the layers of, of uh, uh, meaning and stories that we may have taken on that don't belong to us. Um, I say that when you when you go to meet your ancestors, you want to be standing in your own life and not another's. And if you are not initiated in some way into the the bone memory of your own mythology, you will likely be living a life that's not entirely your own. So, in the context of initiatory passages, uh, rites of passage, initiatory experiences. They're designed to activate the memory of the, the, the gift of medicine that you came into this world to offer. Um, and uh, the way I've learned to think about it from my teachers, um, if you imagine uh, that you, before coming into this world, you, you look down and you, you see what's happening and you say, I have this gift that I can bring there that will help them. And you look around the realm of the ancestors and you say, and I need your help and your help and your help and your help because you too carry this gift. And then we come into this world and coming into this world, um, we, we carry that uh, signature or frequency of uh, a way of belonging to this world that is about that which we have to offer. And we're also connected to certain uh, ancestral helping spirits that also carry that same frequency of, of medicine or gift. Um, there's an old uh, Celtic proverb that says that the troubles in this world, this physical world, can only be, can only be healed from the other world. And yet the troubles that still reside in the other world can only be healed from this world. And so what that tells us is that there's this reciprocal relationship of healing between ourselves and our ancestors. Um, that in indigenous cultures, when they talk about community, they don't just mean uh, living human people. And they don't just mean humans, they mean uh, all peoples, human and non-human peoples, living and non-living peoples, this is community. And so um, Death Lodge brings into uh, that framework, this understanding of a connection with the sacred, with the ancestral realm, um, to, to both heal uh, not only our, our personal stories of, of uh, disassociation from ourselves, 
um, but also any ancestral threads of, of uh, challenge or difficulty that have uh, transferred through the bloodlines um, that we too carry. Um, so this way of, um, so, so in the context of what, what is meant by this word death lodge, it is that, that very thing that, um, that it is a preparation for birth. And so that to, to have a good death, to do that reconciliation, that healing work in death lodge means that it opens up, um, opens us up to the story that lies in front of us. Uh, the story uh, that is, is looking over its shoulders at us, waiting for us to remember um, that pathway. And um, so that's what's meant as Death Lodge. Again, uh, all great journeys. If you speak to anybody that has kind of arrived at a place of recognition um, and, and offering, um, when you ask them about their story, they often begin with great loss, yeah, or challenge. And, and it's that activation that, that sets them on the journey. Um, and so that's the whole, uh, the context of what is meant by this term death lodge. Uh, it is really about awakening to life. Um, so I want to pause there and, and see if there are questions stirring or how that might make sense to some of you. Um, and then I can get more into the, the details of, of uh, what that can look like. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm with is, is what it looks like. And I really, I love what you're saying about this, just the way you're contextualizing it within deep time just feels so important that I'm not, I wouldn't be taking this journey kind of on my own. It's mm -hmm. not the level of my pathology that it's, that it's at such a level and, a, and a, an interconnectedness with that. And I feel resourced by that when you say that. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I'm with is in, in a kind of more gritty way. Like if I came to the lodge, what, could you give an example of what I might be bringing? Like what might I be like, oh, I really need to go to a death lodge. So it might come, uh, the calling to come to something like this might uh, be knocking at your door because you do feel uh, that you're in a period of great challenge, mm -hmm. uh, a period of, we might say, a period of severance where, where the, the life that you have uh, been familiar with in some context, in some way, um, that, you're, that is no longer working. Um, like and that you're, you're called into another way of living that's unconcerned with the comforts of the life you've created very often. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a concern with those comforts. It just keeps, it's just, it's come this way. Um, so what's called a period of severance in one's life. Mm. Or it could be a period of uh, a threshold phase of one's life, a period of betwixt and between, uh, where you've, you've found yourself have kind of moved away uh, from a way of belonging in the world that was familiar, but you don't yet have a new path. You don't yet have a, uh, a way of identifying and belonging to the world that's yet clear. You're betwixt mm. and you're between. Mm. Um, or you may be at a phase of your life we might call an incorporation phase where you're, you're actively stepping into uh, a new story and the road ahead's not clear. Uh, maybe you only get uh, one or two stones in the river that you can see with your feet to put your feet on, but you have no idea what's next. And so it requires a bit of faith, mm. uh, faith in something other than our own uh, set of skills and knowledge that says, you take this step and this step, and when you get over there, that you'll see the next rock, but you can't see it from here. Mm. Um, so this incorporation phase of, of walking into a new story um, where we don't know where we're going. We just know where we're feeling called to next, like following breadcrumbs or, or mm. uh, following a thread um, that we only see a little bit of. Um, as uh, one of the writers in our country here that uh, of years ago, Carlos Castaneda wrote a series of books and he said, you know, there's, <clears throat> there's, uh, 
there's there's two roads one can follow there's uh this one road either either the the road has heart or it doesn't have heart um and the idea is to follow the path of heart follow the road of heart um because it, if it has no heart um then it's not of much use and then he goes on to say because really all paths go to the same place they all go to the same place and and where is that well they all go nowhere <laughs> they all go nowhere and so therefore follow the path of heart this is not about destinations or acquisitions where one finally arrives or acquires something that one is complete that's 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 the great myth uh, or the great lie that we can fall into that you're you're going to get somewhere or acquire something you know when the bands play and the confetti falls and your life is complete and that's the great illusion uh, the truth is all paths go to the same place they all go nowhere however the question is it a path of heart or is it not a path of heart and that's the, the more important question um mm. and so in in um God, how we got down that rabbit hole. I'm, I'm prone to go down rabbit holes. They're interesting. Well, no, <laughs> but the, uh, it's, it's a good hole. <laughs> but the, um, back to the, the, the choreography, might say, of Death Lodge. There's storytelling, like the stories that, that Jules was referencing in the beginning where she and I met at this festival over there last summer um, that began to lay the, the mythological groundwork. Um, and the reason I say that is there's a, a tendency in modern society to pathologize uh, the initiatory journey. And so that when one is in one of these, uh, what I call a, a soul descent, you know, things are breaking down, breaking open, breaking apart. The tendency of those around us who are uncomfortable with that level of vulnerability uh, want to pathologize the story around it like oh you need to you need to go get this medication or you need to see this doctor or you need to like something wrong here and the 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 shift that we need to make is not to pathologize our 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 journey but to mythologize it and see see it as a personal mythology that involves periods of descent and periods of challenge and periods of facing, you know, certain gatekeepers in our life, old ways of loving or old ways of being um, that are hard to let go of. Um, and so when, can, when we can look through the lens of mythology rather than pathology, it opens up a whole different landscape of possibility. Um, and so it's beginning to look at wherever we are from that perspective uh, whatever story you bring to this to this uh to this program to this retreat um and then uh so does one you might say well does one have to have feel a sense of dilemma or challenge um or or feeling like they're in a, a state of of uh disharmony um, or acute distress to come to this. It's like, no, no. Um, uh, you can come to this in, in whatever state you're in because you're going to wake up to more of yourself and you're going to encounter uh, whatever gatekeepers are, are uh, there to, um, to connect with and work with on the way to becoming, you know, more authentically. Uh, connected to yourself and inspired. Um, so one doesn't have to be in acute distress. Um, what you can discover uh, is really more about where you're headed. Um, the story that lies behind you is uh, relevant to the degree uh, that it either blesses or interferes with where you're going, this path mm -hmm. of heart. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes there is a need to turn our attention to the story behind us and gather up parts of ourselves that may have been left along the road back there and, and bring them here. Mm. Um, mm. And, uh, and then there's, there, there's a, also, um, you know, as we move forward, what, 
what may come up to, to impede, impede our, uh, or get in our way, you know? Um, so one of the teachings we begin with in Death Lodge is uh, some teachings around the medicine wheel. And um, what to think about medicine wheels are, we, we would say an indigenous cosmology system. They're different depending on where you live, where, where peoples are from. You know, a medicine wheel here in the uh, plains of North America would be different than in the, um, you know, the mountains of North Carolina where I am, mm. um, or even over there or down in Australia. So these medicine wheels are cosmology wheels of understanding our relationship to ourselves and, and creation around us. Um, so think of it this way. If you stand and face east, on the medicine wheel and you standing facing east at sunrise on a spring morning <clears throat> and, and the pale greens and the trees and the yellows of, of daffodils starting to come out of the ground and the red breasted robins those early birds of spring starting to show up in numbers and you're facing the rising sun uh, on a spring morning and you feel that in your body that's the, uh, that's the initiatory shield of the East. It's the place of, of expanded awareness, of curiosity, of, of vision, of clarity. Um, so it's the place, if we had to begin somewhere on the wheel, I'd say maybe this is the place of beginning with uh, uh, opening of clarity, of, of new vision. And so if you think of walking around the wheel from East or spring, what happens when you are crystal clear about something? What organically happens? Action. Mm. You want to take action. You have this vision. You have this clarity. And so we move into the summer shield of initiation into the South. The South is manifesting. that It's that warrior kind of doing energy. That's in, and in nature, there's a lot of activity in summer. Um, and so we move into the South or the element of fire, we might say. Um, and then when one has completed uh, the, the, the manifesting of the vision they had back in the spring or in the east, um, then there's a slow movement toward the harvest where we're bringing in the, the abundance of that which we have manifested. You know, so on, on the, if I back up a little bit and say like a Celtic wheel, you'd say, well, in bulk, you know, around February 1st, then we move to, to yeah. Beltane, and then we move to Lunasa, uh, in, in this uh, bringing in the harvest. And so on, in the West, in the element of water in the West, we can examine how is it that we allow ourselves to bring in harvest? How do we allow ourselves to receive support? Uh, or do we not? Kind of like, do we allow ourselves in the South to take action or do we struggle with taking action? Um, so in the West is about receiving, bringing in the harvest, allowing ourselves to be supported, um, to take in nourishment. Um, it's a place of, of change and transformation in the West, the setting sun, um, the autumn leaves. Uh, and as we do that, you know, as we take in the harvest, the thing that follows as we know the harvest um, at Samhain is this uh, entering into the dark, the surrender, the release, mm -hmm. the, the north. And so uh, in the old indigenous calendar, Samhain actually marked the beginning of the new year so that like Death Lodge, things began in the dark. They didn't begin with light. They began with the dreaming, the dark time. And so north is that time of letting go. Uh, I say deep surrender, uh, uh, the spirit of winter. Uh, it, it's the place where if, if you've lived on the planet long enough, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say it. It's that place where you surrender so deeply that spring simply shows up because you let go enough. And for no other reason, sometimes magically you just kind of surrender so deep and then your world shifts and you can't explain how it did other than you just let go. That's, mm -hmm. that's the essence of North. That's the essence of the, 
on the on the medicine wheel, that place in winter um, where we let go to something greater than ourselves um, to carry us through the dark time, connecting more deeply to the sacred and moving back around to the east. So each one of these aspects of the wheel reflect aspects of ourselves. So in Death Lodge, along with storytelling, we, we do what I call finding your place on the wheel, where people begin to drop in and, f and walk the wheel. And I have way of uh, information where they find, oh, this is where I feel strong. This is my challenge. These are my edges. And so I kind of find out where am I on this wheel at this time in my life? Uh, what am I working with? What am I uh, struggling with? Um, and, and, and it's in that place that, that the, um, the most medicine exists for each of us, that place of challenge. So if you think of the wheel in this way, so between east and south, this getting clear and taking action. You know, how many of us can say, oh, yeah, I'm really good at envisioning, brainstorming, getting clear about things. But when it comes to really stepping forward into the fire and taking the actions and manifesting, it's like something blocks me. Mm -hmm. And these are what I call the gatekeepers between each one of the four shields of initiation. We run into gatekeepers that inhibit, in this case, action. And, and what's there? What stories or, or encounters from my life that have interrupted my ability to step fully into the summer shield of initiation. Um, and these are places where I call the gatekeepers or old ways of loving. It's usually agreements we've made uh, in, in early in our life about how we respond. Um, say that uh, if I take this action based on this clarity that I have, um, people won't like me or my, my circle of friends will change or um, I won't recognize myself or I'll have to be more responsible. I'll lose my security. Lose whatever the thing is. Yeah. Lose security. Um, so I've made certain agreements about not doing this mm. and I would rather call it confusion than the inability to take action. So I said, I'm just not sure what to do. I said, well, let's go back to the East and, and check in there and say, well, it seems like you are very clear. This isn't a lack of confusion. This is simply picking up the courage and stepping toward the fire, taking the action and taking that risk. You know, things will change. Um, and then like, like the movement from the South or summer shield of initiation into the West, there are many of us that, that are really good warrior and like get it done kind of people. And, uh, but we're not so good uh, as, as one of my teachers used to say, you're kind of stingy with the work because <laughs> uh, you're the one always doing it. It's like, you know, you don't leave room for anybody else. So it's this sometimes the inability to stop this kind of going, going, going. Um, and yet if I let go, uh, what are the fears that come up to meet me between the South and the West that inhibit my ability to receive support? Um, and so we, you know, there's all kind of places on the wheel, like these in-between places between each of the cardinal directions on the wheel where you begin to explore and identify uh, these places of strength and places of challenge. Um, then once we have that map, you say, oh, I see now what's happening. Um, then we move deeper into the work. And when I say deeper into the work, so this, this particular retreat is limited to a certain number of people. I think we have like 10 people or something. And um, because each one of these people are, are going to be, uh, have time to do some ritual process work with the support of the entire group on that, that uh, place that they're challenged. And so think about this way. So in the East, sunrise, springtime, the element of air or wind or voice or speaking or singing, these are aspects of the, the element of the East. We could say air, which can take many forms. Um, the element of the South, we would say, would be fire or action, but definitely fire. Element of the West, we would say, be water, and the element of the North, earth. Um, so, in a in an indigenous context of ritual, 
I like to, to give this analogy. Uh, when, you're, when you go to your doctor and you get a prescription, and then you go to the, the druggist to get that filled, you get this, this bottle of medicine, and you read it, and it's somewhere on there, it'll say active ingredients. And the, there'll be this long word that I can never say, but there's a long word that, that's, and the active ingredients is what gives the medicine its potency, right? So before there were pharmacies and doctors, there were uh, ritual um, and, and shamans, and, and the active ingredients to medicine that they would offer are the elements. So is this a ritual situation that requires fire? Will we find ourselves doing work at the fire with what's happening with this person? Or do we find ourselves going out into the earth and working in the earth, maybe even putting this person in the earth up to, up to here and singing to them? Uh, because the earth is about uh, community and belonging and connection and place. Um, or is this a, a ritual that requires the element of water and healing and reconciliation and forgiveness? Um, so each uh, ritual prescription that comes out, out of a person's story, let's say there's a, in Death Lodge, somebody will have, you know, they'll sit down in the circle uh, next to me and they'll, you know, here's what's going on. And I'll be listening uh, to where they are on the wheel. And what are the ritual prescriptions that will address this place on the wheel that they're in? Um, and then the work just organically begins to, to, to rise up out of that, where we find ourselves at the fire or, or with the earth or with water or, or, or you know, speaking out like with, with the wind. Um, so it is, it is in the elements that these are the, the uh, active ingredients to healing ritual is the elements. And they say when, when you have someone that's doing ceremony and they're not calling upon the elements or the sacred, then they're simply trying to empower something with their own personality. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's going to be uh, less sufficient. <laughs> um, so when, when we move into these healing pieces of work, you know, there is the invocation that also occurs in the weekend where we do call upon uh, the bright and shiny ancestors, um, where we do call upon the elemental ancestors to assist us um, in the unfolding of this work. So I want to pause there. Um, so I can break that down even more and just see what's stirring out there across the ocean. My bladder is stirring. I'm going to go... To have to go and pee briefly. <laughs> All right. Mute Yarek on your laptop. Oh, he's gone. Okay, it's okay. I'm, I'm here. Sorry. Just press mute, then we don't hear the background noise of you. <laughs> Good. Uh, if I can find it, what the hell is We can also mute you from our end. Bottom left. Bottom yeah. left. And no, Jules, you have the power to mute anybody as the host. You can go to their little screen and. Don't have to. That, am I muted? No. Is that it? Don't worry. Don't worry. Right. How do how do I how do you talk? You play share screen. You're talking now. We can hear you. Okay, okay. But my face isn't on the screen. Doesn't come up. That's, that's fine. Yeah. That's just on your personal settings. Yeah, but we can see. All oh, right. Yeah. Oh, I whoa! I've lost everything now. Good. What we see I? you clearly. Okay, I've lost my picture. That's all right. I just put up another screen. That's okay. <laughs> I, I'm just on the edge of control here. <laughs> oh, oh, there it goes. That's you fine. You're back, question, Jeremy. I, I, don't, I don't need. That's fine. If I could talk, I don't need to do anything. I don't need to fill okay. the screen. Okay. I'm very happy to be here. I thought that was absolutely lovely, Kada. Thank you very much. Yes, great to have you, here, Jeremy. I am. I'm remembering the medicine wheel. Mm -hmm. Um. And yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm. Uh, Yes, enjoying this. So any other what questions? Said, What's stirring? Yeah. Questions, questions. I, 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 I haven't got any questions. My head is just open and stuff is coming in. Hey, Astrid. Hi, Kada. Nice to see you again. Hello, everybody else. Hello. <laughs> oh, lots of stirring, Kada. Yeah. <laughs> 
oh my god i'm still in this model thing and um yeah it's getting worse and yet so many answers are coming mm -hmm. but what i wonder about speaking here with you um what are the physical requirements for these things that you do with people you mean the the uh the physical Simply requirements mean would would something prohibit somebody from participating for example um i mean there's uh we're not we're not hiking out into the wilderness we're not spending the night in the woods it is an encampment and i understand from jules at earth heart there are some options to sleep indoors yes. um the the, the work in circle so much of the work in circle is done um, in the lodge in the circle so we're not um, just being able to sit maybe being able to sit for you know a two-hour stretch of time uh would be you know what i think of as maybe the the most stringent thing that one might have to do. we have special floor floor seating that has back support mm -hmm. if you need that but other than that not really um i mean being able to to get yourself there and and move around and there aren't any really uh contraindications that i can think of unless somebody had some serious medical issue um it's it's uh this is this particular experience um is something that i have taken out of the 11 day vision quest where we are out in the wilderness and people are going out for four days and nights so this is the preparation phase of that and i've just kind of taken it out and separated it from that longer uh, experience and put it into the shorter one which enabled us you know to do this even indoors um, but the, the beautiful thing about earth heart is we have we're surrounded by by nature and and, and in nature along with having the indoor yeah. experience yeah yeah we'll have a fire we've got a lake we've got forest and trees so for those who want to go and camp in the forest you can for those who want to be on the land and sleep on the land, you can, and then you can also sleep in a cozy, comfy bed if if that is what supports you more. So there's there's options. Where is it? Earth Heart Earth is in the middle of the Forest of Deans, two hundred thousand acre forest, and it's just on the um, up the Seven uh, Estuary. It's I've just been there, yeah. Seven Estuary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's actually the one of the oldest forests in the UK now. Um, mm. Yeah, it's been here for a long time. But I was with there, Kada, when you were speaking, so many things that you've said, I'm just like, oh, my heart is beating. I can't wait for you to get here. <laughs> but um, also what was really lovely was when you were speaking about the wheel, I don't know if you realize, but the wheel that you're speaking about is the same as the Celtic wheel in terms of the directions and the elements. Mm -hmm. And um, that's really exciting because so much of the work we do here at Earth Heart is about really bringing through these Celtic teachings and the indigenous mm -hmm. teachings from here. So it's lovely that there's this alignment, that there's this energetic resonance with, mm -hmm. the, with the wheel that you're bringing. It's great. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that when I've overlapped the, the Celtic wheel yeah. and, and this wheel, they, they line up really nicely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and what's, What's true is that where I live in the mountains, the highlands of North Carolina, it's very similar to what it looks like there. Wow. Um, in terms of, you know, places of rolling hills and yes. um, temperatures. And so it makes sense that, you know, indigenously, yeah. the, the peoples of ancient times would have oriented themselves to their environment in a very similar way. Yes, yes, um, yes, definitely. And also, I want to acknowledge uh, Lorraine, who I now see. Um, <laughs> uh, my, my screen wasn't showing everybody's face, and uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the elder that is present in the room. And uh, so, welcome, Lorraine. I'm glad to, glad to have you here with us. So, any other thoughts, questions? When is this going to be? june 10 to or as you say over there 10 to 15 june i hope there's going to be more information somewhere 
There <laughs> is. Um, web, either of our websites, there's information there that you can read all of the logistical stuff. Okay. Yeah, we can send you a link to that at the end of the call. Great. Yeah, so we'll, um, and actually we can, um, let's see, I was going to put something in the chat box here in terms of, uh, do you know how to share your screen, Jules? No. Okay, well, I'll share mine. And um, I'll sh so we can actually put this up on the screen for people to see. Oh, hang on. What I'm, gonna sh what I'm gonna share with you initially is my website, then we'll share Jules. So this is one place you can go. I think I'm sharing you now, hang on. Well, don't share yet because I've got something on my screen. Ah. Can you see this where it says the Rites of Passage Council? Yes. Great journeys begin in darkness. So if you go to, the, to this website, ritesofpassagecouncil.org, go over here to programs and go down here to the calendar and then just scroll down till you come to Death Lodge Intensive Forest of Dean, UK. And you can get. Uh, more information there. Um, if you want to know about the actual venue, the, uh, the Earth Heart, then if you go on. So I'm going to stop this. Our website, then it'll give you all the information about how to get there, what facilities there are here, all of that kind of stuff. So that could answer lots of those questions. So if you go to um, Jules' website, I'll do real quick here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to share my swell. Let's see if I can share my screen. Um, I'll get you almost there. <laughs> I've lost you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what happened. I see the people. Yeah, hang on a minute. There we go. <laughs> I don't know why I pressed that. <laughs> uh, you don't push anything. Let me, I'll do this. Okay. If, um, don't try this at home, as they say. <laughs> All right, here's Jules website. There we go. Um, and we will be in this very lodge here. So, which is, yeah, that's beautiful. I've been in there, that's an awesome place. Um, so if you went here to Jules website, went to workshops okay. and then go down to everyone. Yeah. And click there and then scroll down to here where my name is. And you click that. And then you go down, there's, a, um, there's actually a PDF where it says, for more details about workshop, click here. And there is, um, we, have a, we had a different name, I guess, in, originally, um, Reawakening Our Indigenous Wisdom, Open a Heart of Compassion. But this is the workshop, uh, 10 to 15 June, it gives a little more details here. If you just go back, Kadar, to the homepage of my website as well there's mm -hmm. uh, scroll up to the top there so if you click on earth hearts the heading one two three four along and then it says getting here staying mm -hmm. here so there's lots of information there about how to get here what facilities we've got and so on so if you want to see what accommodation there is and what the land is like so you know if you're physically struggling you know you've got options yeah, so there's all that shenanigans there. So probably I'd say go since you're since all of you are over there, I would go to Jules' website. It'll have more local information. Yeah, yeah. Great, thank you, Peter. So let me uh, click off the the share button here. If I can figure out how to do that. There yeah. we go. Now we're back. Okay. So the um, so the as we move into the work, now that I've described the work a bit, then it's really hard to describe because it would look really different for each person. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially imagine 10 people and over the course of the time together, once we begin the intro and begin the stories and teachings around the wheel, then we move into the actual ritual work. And so uh, the way that begins is uh, I'll share a story and the story ends with an invitation for somebody to come up and sit beside me in the circle. And so say that Jeremy came up and sat down. 
the way that I work with people, because I'm also clinically trained, that's also my background as a clinical therapist for since I was 25, um, is a very, uh, my core beliefs is that when there's safety, emotional safety, uh, physical safety, spiritual safety, what needs to happen simply will arise by itself. Um, and so what I do is I just watch somebody sits down and maybe they have a story that they want to share about what's going on. Um, and so I, I, I say 85% of my attention is with the storyteller and about 15% with the story. And as they tell the story, I'm tracking what's going on with the storyteller. And we, we move into the work simply by noticing what's happening all by itself as they're telling the story. Maybe it's a shift in a posture, a deep breath, and, and we come in into that still place of time and mindfulness and enter into the story in present moment right in that spot. And from there, what opens up is everything else. Um, and so in, in working with somebody, there's never, I have no agenda for what somebody does um, once they begin the work. And I really want to have no idea where it's going. Um, Cause as long as I don't have an idea where it's going, the possibilities of where it can go remains endless. Um, and I don't get in the way. So it's really about mindfulness and tracking uh, the very subtle nuances of one's experience. Um, and then following those like breadcrumbs to the next thing, to the next thing. And then all of a sudden what opens up, uh, you know, is, is something magnificent. Um, and the person is themselves is, is really in charge of their own process. So as we, as we begin to deepen in, if we choose, say somebody's speaking and, and they come to a part of their story and they take a deep breath and hold their breath. And I say, well, let's, let's go back to the story where you held your breath. Now take another deep breath and hold it, hold it again right there and tell me what else you notice happening as you hold your breath. You know, what thoughts, feelings, physical sensations, and they'll, just, they'll say, well, this. So well, let's go there. Let's notice that. And so each time we bring attention to the present moment of what's happening, it enables each person to drop down another layer of consciousness into what's underneath that and underneath that. And eventually um, a feeling memory can rise up. Um, a longing can rise up. Um, an unresolved piece of one's story can rise up. Um, so, but it's a very uh, respectful uh, pacing the process so that the, the person themselves is pretty much guiding everything and I'm just tracking and calling attention to what I notice. So that's, that's uh, I guess, clinically how I'm attending to the story. Mm. Um, what I'm doing also is I'm tracking where they are around the wheel and what ritual prescriptions are would address what's happening. And you can see it in the person, you know, they may gravitate towards the fire. You saw that fire in the lodge there. So we may be speaking uh, about this kind of energy of holding themselves back and, and this, this uh, kind of like this, this empowerment piece of work wanting to happen. And maybe they lean toward the fire and then we move up to the fire and begin working uh, to, to bring that in. And then, you know, how that integrates and begins to unfold. So it's really, I can only give you ideas about what could happen for each person. It's really impossible to know because it's so individualized. Um, and then the work unfolds. Um, often there's some cathartic expression. Um, I would say often there's a dance <laughs> that happens after there's movement, there's embodiment. Many times it happens. Sometimes the work is really quiet and, and um, gentle. And, and comforting. Sometimes it can be really loud and, and we're holding space and, and allowing somebody to kind of bring their, their, their full warrior voice out or something. Um, sometimes it can be uh, with stories, I'll say when, when stories have not been witnessed, they're honored, sometimes it really is about the story. Mm. Um, so if there's something one hasn't ever spoken in, in, a, in a healing circle, then it really is about the story and about us giving respectful attention to what is being said. Maybe so they share something they've never shared. And so we bring, bring that respectful, compassionate attention 
to the, and, and that in itself is the healing that they get, they are heard. You know, maybe all that happens is we say, we hear you, we hear you. Um, and so there's a, any number of places the work can go, depending on what's moving with somebody. Um, mm. But the idea is that once we move into the work, we have three, essentially about three full days of that work. And it's, you know, one after another, after another, with breaks, you know, I'd say each piece of work can, on average, can be around two hours. Um, could go longer. Um, but we do usually do two pieces of work in the morning, two in the afternoon, and then we're done for the day. And believe it or not, that, that is a full day. Um, and a piece of work involves everybody. So we're not simply just sitting there, watch, oh, it's so-and-so's turn, I'll, you know, I'll sit here and watch. No, you may find yourself up front with me uh, helping uh, support this person. Or this person might say, you know, I've got this part of me that uh, really uh, struggles with self-doubt. And, and it really, it comes up a lot of times and says, you know, you know, you really can't do that. And so I might say, well, would someone in the room be willing to enroll as the voice of self-doubt that this person has in their head? And York might say, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And so I say, all right, we're going to enroll York as your voice of self-doubt. And so as he says, you know, I don't know what to do. I'm not sure I can do this. Then when I ask if, say it was Jeremy's work, then I would say, you notice what goes on in your body when you hear that voice outside of you, because it's very different. And all of a sudden you start to notice physical things happening in your body, um, a thought, a memory, a, a physical sensation, an image. Um, and then we may put another voice out in the room that says something like, I believe in you. And now you're hearing the kind of these, these things that go on in your head, you're hearing them outside of you. And eventually in, in that kind of work, we're probably going to end up at the fire. <laughs> I can, that's the kind of, I can see where that kind of work would go. Um, and more of an empowerment kind of work. Um, and then there's other kinds of work, as I say, that can be more healing or gentle or, or memories or uh, mm. even when we're dealing with past trauma. Mm. Um, so for, for three full days, we're in it. We're in the work. And, um, and then as we come out uh, uh, toward the ending of the week, once everybody's had their time and, and done that work, we, you know, we're moving more toward uh, usually something festive, something celebratory for, for toward the last evening. And then the final morning, we'll do closing ceremonies and you know, how do you carry this back? Um, and how do you protect this? Mm. You know, if you've connected with something uh, that has been quite uh, elusive in your life, and all of a sudden you feel a deep connection to a, a part of yourself, mm. it's like, how do you hold that and protect that? And we'll, so we talk about reentry and, and carrying this back home. Mm. Um, and how do you continue to, to feed that? Uh, and and um, so that's a, uh, um, and kind of the full process of the experience. Um, and there's lots of laughter. And um, I always learn some new jokes from somebody. Um, so having fun is a big part of it too. Um, it's kind of like when I do grief rituals. It's funny when you ask people what a grief ritual has uh, been like, they talk about how much they laughed. <laughs> yeah. So it is, it is true that, uh, that um, our laughter is proportional to the amount of uh, emotional uh, healing and authenticity we can experience. Mm. Um, so often the road to joy involves, you know, walking these side roads of, of grief or, or, or challenge in order to get there. Mm. Um, so again, we, we end with celebration and closing ceremonies. Um, and of course, nobody usually wants to go home yeah um, <laughs> and so that's uh that's a, a little bit of what it's like and and a uh now that's really in yeah. the death life work I, I i'm already i can see it all here on the land i can i can feel it i can see it i'm already connecting to it so it was a question that came yeah, when question. i visit your land and see this happening jules yeah. um i'll be curious if this happens because i keep seeing somebody actually buried like doing an earth, what's called an earth ritual. 
I don't like to call them burial rituals because earth is a different kind of energy. It's about holding and nourishment and belonging and place. When people have deficits of belonging and deficits of feeling grounded or connected to, to themselves or their community, that's usually an element of earth. Um, so I'll be curious if that happens, if we, you know, if we go out there in your little courtyard and dig a hole for somebody. <laughs> well, we're, we're talking into something because we've, we've had a few of them. We've had a few of them and, and more coming, you know, in the last couple of years. So the land is asking for that. The land is yeah. definitely resonant with that. Yeah, the thing that came to me earlier on was, you know, do, do would I have to have a clear intention of why I was coming or could I just be like, oh, I don't know, I just feel a kind of something for me in this, and I don't really know what it is, but yeah. something non-logical is telling me to go. Yes, or yeah, it, one does not have to be... I know what I'm working with, I've got to know what the issue is, I've got to, no. you know... <laughs> no, just something nudges you and said, come do this, yeah. come do this, and you may say, I have no idea what, I, what I'm coming here for, I don't know what I even want to work on. Yeah. Um, or I might just know that, you know, I don't, I'm not satisfied with, with the place I'm in and I have no idea what to do or what it's about. Yeah. Um, you know, one doesn't have to have that clarity because on the wheel, say if, if I identified the wheel, there is a place between the North and the East where confusion lives. And um, this place of uncertainty um, not sure where I am. Matter of fact, when we do that finding your place on the wheel exercise, when I do this with big groups, I inevitably have somebody come to me and just say, I have no idea where I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, the, over there is the place of not knowing where you're supposed to be mm -hmm. over there and, and see who shows up over there with you and what's going on with you two of you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so confusion, uh, you know, it, it said this way, if you want to be really clear about something first, you have to get really confused, right? Yeah, because um, yeah. that's a, that's part of getting clear is you have to be have to kind of go into that confusion. Mm. Um, so no clarity and in, in, of intent and I want to do this or work on this. That's not uh, what's needed. Um, Thank you. Um, I, I'm yeah. It's interesting. It's like I'm realizing that for most of this call, it's kind of I'm I'm listening to the content of what you're saying. But actually, I'm more with what I'm what I'm hearing that is beyond what you're saying in the words or the explanations, and that feels really potent. And that's not something I can even articulate. But I trust that inherently in myself. Those are the best things that I've ever done have been the ones that call me from that place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's this. Yeah, you know the things we say out here on the surface. These words that, that I'm using and we're using. Uh, that those are just. Uh, doorways there, there's a language deeper than words that is visceral mm. um, and can't really be described other it can be felt um, it, can, it can it can show up in our body yeah. um, and that's why a lot of the work I do is in, in um, tracking the body because the body tells the truest story yeah. our mind can be tricked and confused and we can you know think one thing that's not really what it is but the body mm tells the clear story yeah um and, I'm and that's what i meant earlier here in and you and when you came there was just this real resonance wasn't there it's like the land was just going yes definitely <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i was i was uh, uh yeah i was grateful to, that you were on our track up yeah. up to the questing grounds like oh let's go by jules place she invited yeah. us and all of a sudden uh, i got there i was like wow this is quite a place. <laughs> um, yeah, the land there has a lot of healing to offer. You know, that's that's the other part is it is in the elements, it is in nature that these are allies in our in our own healing journeys. Um, that in in Western or or modern world, uh, we we've disconnected from uh, many of our healing allies, which can be in the trees and in the wind and in the stars at night and in the fire you know, and late in the evening around with stories and, and all these elemental, visceral, language beyond words type of healing that happens. The stars here are amazing because we don't have any light pollution. So mm -hmm. we got that. 
So, Kada, I'm aware that we're, we've run out of time, although I could happily sit here and carry on listening to you. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I guess unless anyone has any last questions or so, we could bring it to close. Yeah. Any last burning questions or smoldering questions? Nah. Uh, can, can I ask about uh, the, the I'd, recording? I'd just like to say, oh, can I ask about the recording? It says a recording. Have I got a recording of it? You, you will. will get a recording of it. Yeah, that's great. Good. Because I, I, I'd like my partner Liz to, to see it. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah, we'll have, um, uh, it, since it's being recorded, we'll uh, be able to download it. Um, and it's going to be sent out to everyone that signed up. There were about oh, 15 people that signed up, even though. Oh, you're, right. Good. I saw that. Yeah. We're going to send yeah. it out to everybody. Excellent. Um, and it'll also be on, uh, I guess, where the event listing is, um, probably on it'll Facebook on, or the uh, website. website. Our website as well on Kadal's page. We'll Lovely. There as that's, well. that's great. I don't need to make a fuss about it then. That's easy. Thank uh, you. Thanks for asking. Yeah, we'll get that up as soon as we can. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Very slow internet here, so it might take a little while, but yeah. <laughs> I'd just like to say that you're looking really well, Kada. Thank you, Jeremy. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's it's yes. nice to see you again. Yeah, yeah. it's been a, been a few a few minutes, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been just a little while, a brief a brief moment. <laughs> yeah, feels that way sometimes with this kind of work. It's like, what were we just talking the other week? <laughs> That's what it feels like. It's nice. It's outside of linear time. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for showing up and also uh, much gratitude to the ones that are showing up later to listen to this. And uh, hopefully I will uh, see you all around the, the sacred fire there at Earth Heart. I am really, really looking forward to it. And anyone who's even on the edge of like umming and ahhing, I just can't encourage you enough to jump. This is just going to be really special and I'm really excited. I want it to happen just so that I can experience beyond anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to go to America. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's just, we need you. We need this stuff over here. So it's really lovely that you're coming. Yeah. Mm. Very Again, thank you for the invitation. Mm. I'm excited to, to be there. Okay. All right. I'm going to well, start. So it is. So uh, everyone, uh, blessings so and, and uh go well and i hope to see you all down the road right yeah, thank you thank you Bye.